Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Garden Hour, our update from good old Garden Line, for those that used to watch that, our one-hour show on public TV. And now, of course, we're on the internet like everybody else is. So thank you for tuning in this evening. And again, I want to emphasize that we do have that Q&A function. And that is a great thing for all of you to use. I mean, we have lots of things that we're going to talk about, but the thing we'd really like to talk about is what interests you the most. And that's your questions. So feel free to put any question you want in there and we'll try to answer it during this hour segment. Well, my name's John Ball. I'm an extension forestry specialist and the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources Forest Health Specialist. So essentially I'm the tree guy. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about where we're at in terms of plant development, some pests we're seeing right now, and then a little bit more update on uh, the ever-growing population of emerald ash borer. And then after me, Amanda is going to take over. So Amanda, what are you going to talk about tonight? I am going to talk about chiggers <laughs> because I got into a mess of them on Saturday and we've been getting some calls. I'm also going to go over some insect development that we've been seeing and put in a plug for an outreach event that's happening this Saturday in the pier area. And then that's, he's, she's going to be followed by Garrett, our, our uh, herbicide guy, or actually our weed guy. I apologize for that one, Garrett. So what are you going to be chatting about tonight? Uh, mainly focusing on uh, weed control and gardens mid-season. All right, fantastic. And then we hope to have Christina from Macquarie Gardens do the Macquarie Garden Minute somewhere about half past the hour. And then finally at the end, but not the least, will be Rhoda Burrell. So Rhoda, what are you going to chat about tonight? I'm going to talk about powdery mildew tonight. Powdery mildew is a dry season uh, disease. So we're seeing a lot of it this year. All right, fantastic. We'll have a great evening here. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned it's a dry season because I'm going, what? I thought that needed moisture, but obviously not because I'm seeing quite a bit of it as well. All right, so we're going to kick right into it here. And whoever has control of the slides tonight has control of your TV. Uh, we're going to kick in here with uh, my slides to begin with, I think. And what I'm going to do is go over a little bit of plant development to begin with. That's something I always like to keep track of. And I think Rhoda has control. Yep, I'm being a little bit pokey here. That's okay. There we are. All right, there we go. Thank you very much, Rhoda. And where we're at plant development right now. Now, by the way, plant development follows our growing degree days very nicely. And in fact, since insects, tend to follow it as well. When certain plants bloom, we can expect to see certain insects arrive. And some years that are cooler than normal, everything's a little bit later. Some seasons it's warmer than normal, everything's a little bit earlier. This year, it's a little bit warmer than normal as or average, as I'm sure everybody watching this uh, can, uh, can certainly understand during some of the heat that we had. Now we did have that little cool spell, but then it warmed up really, really, really fast. Two plants that we have that are mid-season bloomers. One is the false spirea. Uh, it's not even close related to spirea, hence the name false spirea. And the picture that you see there is a Zim, uh, S-E-M, that's the cultivar. And that little false spirea gets about three feet tall and right now it is in full bloom with these beautiful white panicles of flowers. Uh, it's, it's a real interesting plant. The species gets about twice the height. And so when they came up with this cultivar, that was a real plus. However, I will tell you one problem with this cultivar uh, where the species blooms from essentially July all the way till October. This blooms once and it's blooming right now. And so once this finished blooming, even though it's a nice short plant, start, uh, finishes blooming here probably within a month, it'll just stay green the rest of the season rather than continue those flowers that we really, really like. I will tell you, this is one of the toughest plants you can find. Uh, we've planted it in some real harsh locations on campus with very little care and it thrives. Though I will say it does like to spread. So put it in an area it cannot escape. 
Uh, if you say, well, I'm going to plant my perennials with it, you will never see your perennials again. They'll be hidden by this plant. Uh, but it's a good, tough as nails plant. You're not going to call me and say, what do I spray? The other one's a nice little tree, and it's the Amaramachia. It gets about 20 feet tall, and it's our late summer flowering. Generally, this is not blooming till the end of July. I've even had it bloom the first week of August, and it's blooming now on campus. I mean, this is several weeks early. We're at about 1,400 growing degree days. Back in 93, I think it was, our year without a summer, uh, it stayed cool all year. We were at about 900 growing degree days at that point. So we're ahead of what our average is and we're ahead of some of our cooler years by a long shot. Well, this little tree has those beautiful white flowers right now. They smell like fresh cut alfalfa, which I kind of like. It's a low maintenance little tree, about 20 feet. Think of it as a crab apple, but it blooms in July. And we don't have a lot of trees that bloom in July. And by the way, Despite the fact it flowers at a time period, nothing else does. It makes its own nitrogen. Uh, it's a nice, hardy little tree. It's rare to find in a landscape. And you know why? Because it blooms now and nobody's shopping into garden center right now. People tend to buy what's in bloom. I managed garden centers for years and they all come in in April and May. And this plant in April and May just kind of looks like a stick. Uh, so they kind of pass it by. But if you're thinking, gee, I got a nice spot in my garden for a small tree, 20 feet, and you'd like something to, to bloom, uh, we'll be happy to do that. It's a great little tree and you would love it. Well, uh, next slide, please, Rhoda. I forgot that you're in control, not me. And so I want to show you a couple things that are going on and notice they're all with elms. Uh, elms have a lot of little problems out there and we're seeing them right now. And, and the reason we are is, well, we still have a lot of elms in the state. And by the way, these problems are most common with Siberian elm. Uh, what an elm that a lot of people refer to as Chinese elm. And Chinese elm is a completely different species. Um, it's a really nice tree, also known as a lace bark elm. Um, so, uh, and we can grow a few of them in Yankton, and that's about as far north as they grow. But the Siberian elm is across the entire state. And uh, right now, I'll start on the middle one, we're seeing the European elm flea weevil. And if you go out and look at your Siberian elms, and they're just filled with holes, that's what this insect does. Now, as you might expect, it's not native here. Uh, it arrived in this country, some people think in the 80s, but certainly by about 2000. 2003, they found it in Illinois. And then by 2009, I think it was, we found it in South Dakota. And it's just riddles these trees. Uh, now, another important thing is that if you get an elm tree, a hybrid elm, and they are Dutch elm disease resistant, so they're great trees. But if you get a hybrid elm that has any Siberian elm in its parentage, that's what the leaves are gonna look like. And so uh, hybrid elms such as Vanguard, which are a cross that includes Siberian elms on campus, all their leaves look exactly like that. Uh, some of the others such as the Acolyte elm, which does not have a Siberian elm in its parentage, uh, they look, and they're standing right next to the vanguards. They look perfectly fine. No leaf out of place. And then right next to it, to the right, and you're looking at the ground there, that's the elm leaf beetle. And the elm leaf beetle also likes Siberian elms quite a bit and will defoliate those. And uh, 20 years ago, it was the defoliator before the European elm flea weevil came in. Uh, but now we have two pests that will defoliate Siberian elms and uh, some hybrids that have it in the parentage. Interesting enough, they really don't go after our American elms as much. However, the first picture on the side there, uh, that is an American elm leaf, and that is the woolly elm aphid. And it literally curls the leaf like that. So it looks like a gull. And if you pull that little gull open, it's gonna be white in there. And what you're seeing is a lot of little aphids, the woolly aphids. And the woolly aphids right now are leaving those leaves. They're finished up with their damage. 
And now they're heading over to other plants that have an alternate host and they'll feed there and then come back in the fall. So when you look at these pictures, any spraying done now for these problems is what we call revenge spraying. Uh, you're spraying to finish off a few that are still straggling around, but for the most part, the damage is done now. Now, the good thing for all these is the damage is really cosmetic. Um, if you don't mind looking at an elm filled with holes, it's absolutely fine. Uh, it could really care less. Well, the next slide, there is some care. So if I could have Rhoda give me the next one here. And this is the Zimmerman pine moth. Right now, I'm getting a lot of calls from people with scotch pines and Austrian pines and ponderosa pines and even some big mugle pines. And when they call up, they say, I'm getting some dieback. And by dieback, they mean a branch or two in the canopy is dying back. Not the whole canopy, but a branch here and there. And when they look at that branch, right where it's attached to the trunk, they find this, this goo. And it's really pitchy when you touch it. It's sticky, just what you'd expect. And it's got all these small granulars in it. And if you pull those apart right now, as I did, you're going to find this little worm in there. And that worm is a Zimmerman pine moth larvae. Uh, it's an interesting insect. It's actually the eggs are laid last summer. The larvae hatch in September or so. And then all they do is wander and just get under a little bit of bark and hide there for the winter. And then come spring and early summer, they burrow into the tree live in there for several weeks, feeding away, uh, form a little cocoon, and then emerge as adults in uh, sometime in August. And that, and what these tend to do is not kill trees, but since they attack where the branch is connected to the trunk, what happens is the branches break off. So what you'll see in a shelter belt or somebody's trees in their yard is that the branches will be breaking on them. Sometimes they'll attack the top. So if you ever look at a tree that's misshapen, uh, it may be due to a Zimmerman pine moth attack. And it's, in terms of insects, it's probably one of the most common throughout the state. I can find these out in the Black Hills of South Dakota in Rapid City. There's some HOAs out there that uh, their pines, their ponderosa pines for the most part are filled with them. You go down to Sioux Falls, you'll see Austrian pines filled with them. You come up to Brookings, South Dakota, I can show you Scott's pines filled with these. So again, it's a fairly common insect and it can be managed uh, with sprays. Uh, typically we spray either in April to kill that little larvae here before it burls into the wood, or we spray in August after. So when the eggs hatch, the new little larvae are walking across the bark are killed by the pesticide. But in both cases, the pesticide has to get to the bark. So you can't just miss the entire canopy. Well, next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Uh, a little bit more on emerald ash borer. Uh, again, we're seeing it expanding in the communities to which we know it's there, principally being Sioux Falls and Canton. And if you take a look at that picture there, that's the classic picture of a tree that's been infested by emerald ash borer for several years. You'll notice the top now has died back. But what I want you to notice is in the center of that picture, we have this real big tuft of foliage, very dense. When you see something like that, uh, that's a pretty good indication that that tree is infested. Uh, because these are the classic symptoms. And right there in my hand is a little emerald ash borer. Uh, that's the adult. It's dead. That's why it looks a little stiff there. Uh, but you can kind of get a sense of scale. They're about a half inch long. Now, we're on the downside in terms of emergence. Uh, about a week or so ago, we were at peak emergence. About half of them that were going to emerge this year had emerged. Now we're on the downside. In a couple more weeks, they'll be through emerging. They live anywhere from three to six weeks. So what we're seeing this year, even though it's been a little bit warmer than normal, is that it fits with our bookends. Emerald ash borer is out flying essentially between Memorial Day and Labor Day. 
Uh, and that's why in Sioux Falls, they don't want you moving firewood or wood, ash wood. Don't cut ash trees, prune ash trees during that time period because you're going to be moving the adults possibly as well. And no matter what time of year, you cannot move hardwoods, doesn't matter the species, out of Minnehaha, Lincoln, or Turner County. So no movement of firewood out of those counties, no movement of raw logs, no movement of any of that wooden material. And the reason I say any of that, unless it's been a treated, is that a lot of people are very bad at identifying wood. And this way it's like, no, you just don't move it. Because again, the most common way this insect's going to move is probably somebody carrying it in a piece of wood that they have in their car or their truck. So we wanna avoid those problems. Well, that's kind of an update from me. And then uh, I think I'll turn it over to Amanda. So thank you. All right, uh, Rhoda, I'll take my slides, please. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna hop right into it. And we do have, I noticed a question in the chat asking for someone to explain how growing degree days are calculated. And essentially growing degree days are, you can have them at different sort of base temperatures, depending on if you're looking at plant development or insect development, um, but you take the average temperature of that day. So usually it's the high temperature minus the low temperature divided by two. Um, and then um, subtract your threshold and that's how you get your degree days. Um, and we usually use base 55 uh, Fahrenheit for a lot of things. Sometimes it's base 60, it depends on what you're looking at, but that's essentially how we calculate degree days. And every year they sort of start over on January 1st. Um, apple maggots are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Did John forget to talk about apple maggots? <laughs> well, I quite honestly, I was running out of time, so oh. <laughs> I thought I would put, pick this up at the end. All right, uh, back to the apple maggots. The I'm apple like, is this maggot, a quiz? So I, but that's yeah. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about apple maggots, but yeah, I was going to talk about chiggers. Uh, no one needs to see any sort of bite pictures of chiggers or any other insect bite. I would just like to reiterate that I am a doctor of entomology. I'm not a medical doctor, so I cannot diagnose your skin condition. Please don't send me those pictures. I don't want to see them. <laughs> uh, but chiggers are the immature form of the trombiculid mite. So they are mites. So mites are in the arachnids family, you know, with our ticks, with our spiders. And they are very small when they're in this immature stage. So usually we don't see them when we are out places. We really only notice that we got into them when the bites show up. And uh, can confirm, I am very sensitive to chigger bites. Their biology is really interesting and it has been misunderstood for centuries at this point. There are so many myths about chiggers on the internet um, that if you are looking at a website and it doesn't end in .edu, I can almost guarantee that you're reading incorrect information. Chiggers do not burrow into your skin. They do uh, inject some saliva into you and that's what sort of digests your skin and makes sort of a goo that they can suck out and that's what they feed on. But they do drop off your body to go continue their life cycle. It is just the immature forms that feed on people or other mammals, it's not the adult chigger. So if they were burrowing into our skin, they wouldn't be able to complete their life cycle. Um, ways to sort of prevent them, Wearing repellents. It's a good decision in South Dakota for our ticks, also for our mosquitoes, and also for chiggers. Um, you can really sort of repel three different uh, kinds of critters by just making sure you're wearing um, an, an EPA approved active ingredient insect repellent. Also, I really recommend that if you are gardening or hiking or you're in a place where you know that there are chiggers, when you are done being in that place, go inside hop in the shower like immediately. The chiggers actually need to climb, they sort of like climb up your body, wander around a bit before they decide to feed. So you can actually physically remove them from your body before they get a chance to bite. Um, so taking a shower, throwing your clothes in the laundry, that will go a long way towards cutting down on your number of chigger bites. 
I know a couple locations here in Pier that definitely have chiggers and I've added a few to my list of if I go there, I need to shower afterwards. Otherwise I'm gonna end up with 25 bites on the lower half of my body. Um, I did say that you can't diagnose from a bite alone, but chiggers do have some bite behavior that can clue you into the fact that you got into them. Chiggers will crawl up your body and they will feed at a point where they hit resistance. So that tends to be around sock lines or underwear lines or waistbands. Um, so if you're noticing a concentration of bites in those areas, you may have gotten into chiggers. A lot of people also will develop a blister on the chigger bite, but that is not consistent across all people. I am the type of entomologist that does sometimes let things bite me just so I can see what happens. Um, I don't generally recommend that as I've got a pretty funky um, lacewing larva bite on my wrist right now. So I'm gonna stop that experiment in the future. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my update on chiggers. Make sure you're wearing your repellent. It'll help save you some itching. And as we get more into West Nile virus season, it will also protect you against the mosquitoes that vector that virus. Uh, next slide, please. We'll talk about some fun stuff like monarch eggs. Um, I was in my backyard on Saturday doing some gardening and I noticed that I finally had a monarch butterfly uh, flying around my yard. And so I followed her and was able to pick up two eggs that I saw her lay. Um, and so I will be rearing out those caterpillars. This is actually about a month later than I would sort of normally be rearing out caterpillars. Uh, usually I get some in early June. And you know, by this point, the adults have been released to go continue their life. Their life. So hopefully, uh, subsequent uh, garden hour updates. I'll have some caterpillar updates as well for my new additional inside pets. And you know, rearing out butterflies is is fun. It can be really educational for kids. Um, but please don't take biological material. You know, don't take plants or um, eggs from public land, um, please only, you know, take those things from your own property or property where you have permission from the landowner. So please don't go out into our state or national parks and collect monarch eggs. Uh, next slide, please. My cool insect for this week is the cicada killer wasp. Those are out and about and they are not murder hornets. I feel like murder hornets were so 2020, um, but I know there's probably somebody out there itching to make a joke about them. Um, but the cicada killers are out and they feed on, or they actually use cicadas as part of their life cycle. Uh, the female wasp will actually hunt cicadas out of the trees and paralyze them and she then uses that cicada as food for her larva. Cicada killers are ground nesting solitary wasps. So you don't don't imagine like, you know, a, a big like paper hive full of these like inch and a half long insects. They are solitary, they nest in the ground and they really only care about cicadas. I have one that's around our office down here in Pier. I also have one in my backyard. The one in my backyard is pretty much the coolest thing I've ever seen. I was driving down my alley yesterday on my way back to the office from lunch and I heard a cicada and then I heard it stop screaming. I heard a thunk and I looked over and it's the cicada killer, she had gotten the cicada out of the tree and hit the pavement with it and was carrying it off to her nest. So they're absolutely fascinating creatures. I highly recommend that if you have them in your yard, you just live with them. Please don't try to you know, manage them or kill them because they are just a really, really interesting insect. Um, the males are the ones that tend to be sort of territorial. They will sort of patrol an area, um, but they don't have a stinger. They don't have the ovipositor, so they, they can't even sting you even though they might look terrifying. Um, and Rhoda asked how big these wasps are. I have one in my collection that's fairly small, not even an inch long, but most of them are about an inch and a half or closer to two inches in length. So they are probably our largest um, sort of stockiest wasp that we have flying around in South Dakota, which is why they gain attention every year. They do prefer to nest in sort of a sandy or, or bare soil area. So if you have those parts or you, if you have that kind of habitat in um, maybe your yard or your garden or like next to a garage or somewhere, you know, there's, there's really no way to stop them from using that area unless you just like pave it over or, you know, plant it into grass. But even then they will sometimes dig into turf to um, make their nests as well. And, you know, those soil mounds are really just cosmetic. You can, you know, knock them back down um, and 
but yeah, they're just a really, really neat insect with a really funky life cycle. And now that we can hear the cicadas in the trees, uh, the, wasps are, the wasps are out as well. So this is about on time for them, maybe a little bit early, um, you know, with some of the, I know the heat that we've been having in Pier. And it actually finally rained last week for the, the first time all summer. So I think that soil moisture helped bring out some of the cicadas and then also the wasps that were just kind of waiting in the ground. So go to the next slide, please. And I wanted to put in a plug for an outreach event that we're doing here in uh, Fort Pier at Owyhee Downstream on Saturday, the 17th from 9 a.m. to noon. If you're in the area or looking for something to do this weekend, um, we are doing our Little Wings on the Prairie events. So there will be a couple different organizations there with tents and activities. Um, for kids and adults. And you can see our pollinator garden that we've had out there since 2013 is when we planted it. You can see in this picture that um, the plants are doing pretty well. We've also had you know, a lot of grass move in over the years, um, but this part of the garden is actually irrigated. So that's part of the reason why our plants are doing so nicely. Otherwise everything would be, I think a lot uh, stumpier and browner. Um, we've had some issues with grasshoppers coming in there because it is sort of this oasis of green in the surrounding grassland. So if you're interested in pollinators and also maybe taking a look at, you know, how we manage some of the pests out there, um, it's, a, it's a fun garden to visit. There are chiggers, so I will be wearing DEET and I will also be taking a shower like as soon as I get home um, because I know that garden is a total hot spot for chiggers and I get bitten every time I go out there. I still go out, but I've got to definitely take precautions. Um, so yeah, and it is on uh, state park property. So you do need a park sticker to get in, uh, but we're hoping for some decent weather and a good turnout. So if you are in the area, please uh, feel free to come and join us. And if anybody has any questions about insects or their relatives, uh, make sure to throw those in the Q&A. I will be uh, keeping an eye on that as we've got other folks speaking as well. So I think at this point, I don't see Christina, so we'll turn it over to Garrett. All right, thanks, Amanda. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. I think this is what I wanna do. All right, you should be able to see that hopefully. All right, do you guys see that? Yes. Oh, I think I gotta hold on. For some reason, I cannot see. Sorry, now I don't have any issues. Share. I want to try one more time. All right, here we go. All right, sorry about that. So I want to talk a little bit about a few annuals and perennial weeds um, that I've seen prevalent in yards, um, especially lately, and kind of uh, how we control them, maybe uh, why we shouldn't be spraying some of these right now, et cetera kind of depends on where in the state you are. If you got moisture, if you don't have uh, moisture. On a, a drier area, a lot of these, especially this one picture on the bottom left, that is filled bindweed. It could also be more of a pinkish flower as well, but that's a common one right now I'm seeing across the state. Um, of course, dandelion is the top picture there and, and prickly lettuce there on the bottom right. Um, I see a, quite a bit of that, at least in the Aberdeen area. Again, all those are, are uh, filled bindweeds, a perennial, um, so is dandelion. So those are going to be best controlled in the fall uh, after the first frost. This is not a great time to control those. You could spray some of those, depends on the situation. Uh, if you get some moisture, they're not under stress. You could slow them down, uh, stop production of seed. Uh, prickly lettuce is an annual. Uh, at that, of course, at that side of the picture there is uh, better to just pull it out by hand. But uh, spraying that as well is okay at the moment, as long as it's not under stress. So it depends if you have moisture. Perennial will be better later, but you can't control those now. Other ones I've seen a lot, uh, bottom left, 
Uh, green foxtail is the main grass issue we see a lot, especially even in gardens. Uh, again, I wouldn't, I'll talk about more about garden control, but uh, in yards, uh, there's nothing really in yards you can control it right now with. Uh, that works great. And not this age, especially unless it's, if it's mature, uh, mature plant like that, grass and annual is going to be tough to control this time of year. Uh, with uh, a purse lane bottom right. Again, purse lane is one of those that if you uh, have in your yard, it's going to be a tougher one to kill, uh, especially this time of season. It's better to do it um, when it's a little cooler and early in the season. And upper right, that's uh, spotted spurge. I have a lot of that in my cracks in my driveway. Uh, again, you, if you have cracks in driveway, you could either just hit it with Roundup, um, something like that, or pull it out. But again, those are pretty tough plants, and it's better to spray those when it's not under stress. So or after a moisture, so if we get some rain tomorrow, um, it'd be better to spray that maybe Thursday or Friday when the plants are actively growing if they're not already possibly out of stress. It depends if you got moisture, I guess, the last few days. Those are some common ones I've been seeing lately um, across uh, yards and stuff in my own yard, et cetera. If you have any questions on uh, weed issues, let me know. I can kind of hit those up here in the future. So uh, mid-season garden weed control, uh, when it comes to, of course, uh, it'd be best um, if you start out cleaning this spring, but if you're having some issues with some of these species, especially like uh, purslane or or maybe some grass species, crabgrass or uh, green foxtail. A lot of those can be suppressed um, somewhat, at least with the annual weeds, um, pull them out, cover them up with grass clippings, weed-free alfalfa, hay, straw, wood, clip, wood chips. But again, those are not gonna be 100% control. I wouldn't suggest using cardboard, uh, like lasagna gardening in mid-season, I do that in the fall. But newspaper can be used uh, or even like a butcher paper if it's clean, uh, put that down and then put uh, organic material on top of that, suppress weeds around your plants. Or if you wanna go the non-organic uh, approach, it'd be uh, using weed fabric or plastic ground covering, uh, especially around flowers, et cetera, that works really good. But uh, even if you have living growing weeds, you can just put fabric around on top of them. And if it's good fabric, you can suppress weeds doing that without having to till it up or anything else like that. So again, tillage is gonna be a, an issue with some of these purslane. If you till purslane, it's just gonna spread it around. And a lot of, if you have green foxtail or yellow foxtail, uh, the seeds out, you're just gonna be spreading seed around. I'm guessing if you have those, you already have a pretty good uh, weed seed bank in your soil. So the more you till, um, the more weed seed you're probably gonna bring up to the surface or close to the surface and they can germinate. When you water your garden or when we get another flush of rain here, you'll see uh, weed seeds germinate. So trying to keep those uh, weed seeds down in the soil uh, in an area where they can't germinate. If they do germinate, they're underneath a, a weed fabric or uh, some kind of organic mulch to help suppress those. And if over time um, controlled properly, you won't have too many problems mid-season. I usually don't have very many problems in my garden mid-season. It's mainly spring. Um, most of my weed problems are in the spring. But I have a, a note. This is actually last year's picture. I forgot to take a picture of this year. Um, but it's uh, if you took the Master Gardener class, you probably saw something similar to this. I show this picture. But it's a no-till garden. I started out lasagna garden in, in the fall about four years ago. Uh, use wood chips, mulch, um, uh, lots of grass clippings on it uh, every fall and even throughout the spring. And that keeps my weed pressure pretty low. Again, I do have some in the spring. That's mainly through uh, stuff I bring in probably through mulch or uh, compost, stuff like that. But uh, in general, I don't have a weed problem. I never tilled it. I don't have problems there with weeds. So mid-season, all I do is add a little more grass clippings from the yard, weed-free, keep my weeds down. Because I'm going for this effect, this is uh, my, this is actually a little shovel full of soil I, I dug out of our garden a few weeks ago. Um, again, very, uh, a lot of fibrous root system in there, healthy soil. The weeds I do have, I can use two fingers and just, bear, just pull them out. All the root system comes out every time. I never have a compaction problem. I do stand in my garden, not when it's super wet, of course, but I do walk in it 
Uh, my family walks in it to pick stuff and we have no problems with compaction just because I don't till. And there's a lot of earthworm activity. Um, willing to say that looks uh, messy, but that's uh, easier to control weeds, et cetera, in that situation. Other, I've seen this picture as well, um, a guy named Gabe Brown by Bismarck. Um, he uses alfalfa and hay a lot and wood chips. Um, he just, that's all he does is lay out. He has this, this garden, he has about an acre. I've been there and he puts down wood chips and then hay on top of that every year, a lot of alfalfa uh, to put nitrogen in the soil. And uh, he has a few weeds, but in general, not too bad. Never sprayed it, 100% organic uh, issues there. So mid season when it comes to it, again, going back to this, just want to be looking at uh, ways to avoid uh, bringing more weeds into the garden and also how to suppress those uh, naturally. So I don't know if there's any questions. I can see Garrett, here. there's one on what can you use in your yard for thistles? Thistles, what kind of thistle? They say, uh, I'm trying to get back to the main view here. It doesn't specify. Okay. Well, for, uh, there we go. What can I use on main thistles? So if it's, uh, I'm guessing it's Canada thistle. If it's South Dakota, it's usually Canada thistle. Um, it's, it's a perennial. So again, it depends on the situation. If you can avoid it, I would just keep it, suppress it down, keep it from uh, in a yard situation, uh, from seeding out until the fall. And then I'd spray the rosette um, after the first frost, that'd be the easiest way to control it. But in a garden, anything that has, um, again, it, uh, not in a garden, sorry, in a yard, um, be careful around gardens. Uh, I wouldn't do this right now. Um, spray anything with 2,4-D dicamba MCPP in it. A lot of your home home goods stores will have that. So that's an option. Or uh, if you want to go to organic approach, I mean, vinegar, I've killed um, can of thistle with just vinegar, high doses of vinegar, a little bit of Dawn dish soap. Uh, and some, if it's like a rocky area, you don't care about killing everything in that one area, just douse it down with that. And I've killed can of thistle with vinegar. So that's an option. Um, yeah, it just kind of depends on the situation, what thistle it is. If it's an annual thistle, it's gonna be a little easier. You could just pull it out. But if it's a perennial like can of thistle, you need to, you need to probably spray it. It'd be pretty tough to get the root system out. Uh, there was a reply. It was Canadian. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's what I figured. It's South Dakota. So, yeah. And yeah, I mean, if that's if there's a specific situation you want to control, can of thistle in, let me know and or email me or or call me and we can talk more about that. I think that's. Yeah. Did, uh, did this question, uh, looks like we had a question from Barbara Sparks about liquid seven stay effective to control Japanese beetles. I typed an answer to that one. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. In that case, I think it's probably time for me to talk about powdery mildew. So powdery mildew, as I mentioned earlier in the evening, is, a, is actually a dry year problem. It's one of the few fungal diseases that does not require free moisture on the leaf for infection. In fact, spraying these down with water actually decreases the amount of powdery mildew. So it's just the opposite of what we usually give our standard garden advice, you know, uh, use drip irrigation or soak the hoses, don't overhead water. If you've got a lot of powdery mildew, actually setting up a sprinkler is not a bad thing to do. What it does require is high humidity. So when we get these warm days with high humidity, uh, that's when the powdery mildew can get started. Uh, we have powdery pictures here of four different kinds of powdery mildew. One's on lilacs, one's on peas, uh, 
one's on turf grass, and the other, I believe, was flocks. So all of these can be quite susceptible to powdery mildew, uh, depending on the variety. And so one of the things that you might consider if you're struggling with powdery mildew is, is to look for a different uh, variety to plant. Of course, if you've got old fashioned lilacs and, and they're large, uh, it's very typical to see uh, powdery mildew to do on those. And it doesn't actually hurt them that much. It does cut down some on the photosynthesis, but you, you'll see huge old lilac bushes have this year after year after year. So uh, it may be kind of unsightly, um, but it, it may not be all that damaging to the plant. Um, an interesting feature of this is it's a different species of powdery mildew that infects each of these four different species. So the, the powdery mildew on the lilac will not go to the turf grass. The turf grass will not go to the peas. The powdery mildew on the peas won't go to the flocks. You get the idea. So that's kind of a comfort thing to know that if your lilac is filled with it, it's not going to infect the rest of your plants. Of course, where we often see it is on, on the cucurbits, on squash and pumpkins. And on our two photos on the left here, we've got, you can see just the powdery coloring. And, and it can get bad enough on pumpkins to actually uh, kill the leaf if, if it's really heavy. Uh, so. In that case, we, we might need to keep an eye on it. Here we've got pumpkins that are pretty much formed and it's so late in the year, it probably doesn't matter anyway. But you see the close up of the powdery mildew. Uh, you can see why it's appropriately named. Uh, it just looks like somebody took a powdery in sort of a random, but fairly even uh, covering over the leaf. Now on the right hand side of every year we get get pictures of leaves like this and I've seen some this year already with uh, it's got these little white spots on on the pumpkin leaf and so people uh, assume that it's powdery mildew well it's not <laughs> these kinds of pumpkins uh, some varieties just have a leaf that naturally as it matures kind of gets these white white markings on it but this is totally natural no fungus involved in this case. The two on the left, yes, but you can kind of see the difference when you when you compare them uh, side by side. There are some home remedies for powdery mildew. Uh, one of the easiest uh, that probably everybody has in their kitchen is baking soda. And so you can put a tape, tablespoon of baking soda, depending on the plant, you can probably go up to two tablespoons per gallon of water. And then you may want to add a half teaspoon of either some kind of cooking oil or a half teaspoon of insecticidal soap or maybe hand soap. Uh, don't use detergent, but the oil or the soap will help the spray spread evenly over the leaf because otherwise with some leaves it may just sort of ball up on the surface of the leaf and that doesn't do you any good. So this this is like a sticker spreader in, in terms of if you've used uh, those in herbicides. Uh, so it helps the the formula to spread over the surface of the leaf and, and contact all the powdery mildew. Um, usually with the squash leaves they'll take the water up so that's not an issue but you can try it both ways if you need. Spray it has needed, so you're going to have to re reapply after a good rainstorm. And of course, the plants continues to grow, so you're going to need to treat the new foliage. But this will actually do a pretty good job on powdery mildew. Uh, years ago, when I was a technician in a winter wheat breeding project in our greenhouse, we got powdery mildew on the wheat. And uh, I took this powder, this baking soda uh, remedy over it, and I was actually pretty amazed at how well it worked. Uh, it, it it does take some some re repeat uh, applications, and so if you're getting this every year, 
you probably don't want to put that much sodium out on your garden because it can build up over time. So in that case, if you're having problems year after year, uh, one option is to look for, there's a number of commercial sprays available with potassium bicarbonate instead of sodium bicarbonate. And they come in a number of different trade names, but look for the potassium bicarbonate because potassium is, is a very common, obviously plant nutrient. So that's not gonna be the issue that baking soda could be over time. Or better yet, look for those resistant varieties. Uh, we've got resistance available on a lot of a lot of different crops, our, our cucumbers and and pumpkins and winter squash varieties uh, all have had breeding so that they can overcome this problem with powdery mildew and you never have to worry about to start with. Another uh, set of plants that often get powdery mildew quite badly are uh, bee balm. And again, there are resistant varieties. So look for those resistant varieties. And agastache, uh, which is kind of a, a mint. And this can get uh, the powdery mildew as well. So again, look for resistant varieties. And we'll see if we have any more questions. I want to remind you that if you come up with questions during the week or you sign off and two minutes later you think, I should have asked the, this, you can do that. You can either call any of the three regional centers at Aberdeen, Rapid City, or Sioux Falls. You can email them. Or if you look at the bottom here, the extension.sdstate.edu backslash garden yard. And there's a drop down menu for, for problems. And if you go to that, there's actually a form on there that you can fill out for an ask an expert. Uh, but uh, these are probably the easiest to start with at the regional centers. Or you're welcome to email us as well uh, with questions. Uh, and we'll, we'll get those uh, for you. And Amanda has put in the uh, URL in the chat box uh, for the Ask an Expert or uh, the page that, that contains both this information and the information on the fill in the blank. And then Rhoda, since we've got some time, can you throw my picture back up of the bag? Oh, wagon? right, yes. <laughs> since we're... There we back go to, here. There we are, apple All maggot. Right. All right, well, super. And that's not what you want to see coming out of your apples, uh, by the way. But that is, in fact, a little apple maggot. And by the way, that would be a little early right now to be coming out because they're mostly going in. And uh, I saw them starting here uh, several weeks ago. But this is also known as a little railroad worm. It makes these tracks through the apple. Uh, it's not the coddling moth. Coddling moth makes a big hole at the bottom of the apple, and you'll find all this frass and that, and they're actually going after the seeds in the apple, and the apple just happens to be in its way, where the apple maggot is burling through the apples, and sometimes they're kind of hard to see in there, um, because as you can see, they're, they're white, they're legless, uh, but uh, what you'll see is that when mom lays the eggs uh, during the month of July, usually early July, they're starting. Uh, what they'll do is you'll get these little dimples and the little apple maggots will go in and burl through the apple and you'll get eggs laid over a fairly long time period. Um, what's interesting is they tend to come out of the ground, the, the flies, the adults come out of the ground after a rain. And so when I worked in Michigan, it was always you timed your sprays too that after rain, you ended up putting on a nether coat. Now, there's a couple ways of managing apple maggot. One is that you can hang bright red balls in your trees, uh, paint them cherry red, cover them with a sticky material. Tanglefoot's the common one. You can even buy 
apples that are made that way. And you usually want to hang up about three per tree. And you wanted to have them up already or get them out there tomorrow. Yeah, you may be a little late. But uh, what happens is mom is a good mom. She wants her kids to have the best. So she's going to lay her eggs on the biggest, brightest red apples. And despite the fact there's other flies stuck on it, she doesn't seem to be deterred by that. And so she'll get stuck on that. And it helps in two ways. It'll reduce the population of apple maggots. And it'll also let you know when more are coming out. Um, there's also sprays that you can use, uh, seven and malathion are kind of our two throwbacks to it and that can be done. And then you can bag the apples uh, using these Japanese grow bags that are put around the apple and helps prevent it as well. Now, Rhoda works with fruit and Amanda is a bug person. So I'll bet they might have something to say on the apple maggot too. So Rhoda, have you got anything to add now? I, again, to me, it's 50-50 in terms of what's our worst insect problem, apple maggot or coddling moth, because I seem to get samples of both. It seems like the apple maggot is a little less common out here on the west side. Uh, the coddling moth is definitely out here, uh, but it seems like I see less of the apple maggot. I'm not sure if that's, that's the case, but it, of what I've gotten in. Uh, you know, and I would agree with that. Uh, I see more apple maggot out here, uh, east end of the state than I do west and west. And, and again, we can find them both throughout. Uh, so they both are ones you really do need to treat in order to have edible apples. I used to tell people that the most expensive apples you'll ever eat are the ones you try to grow yourself. Uh, because it can take a lot of treatments. I mean, people love organic until they bite into a coddling moth, uh, and then it kind of fades out on them. Now, again, you can do that. I'm not saying no, but it does take a lot more work. And I will say this, I, I ran across a producer that the thing he did the most, and it's really important, is he never let an apple fall. Uh, he cleaned up, and sanitation is big. Uh, if you let the apples just drop on the ground and rot for even a little bit, you're increasing your problems. So good sanitation is important. Uh, Amanda, anything to add on our little apple maggot or coddling moth for that? You're in the middle <laughs> of the state, so perhaps you're seeing it both ways. Right. Yeah, I so I don't get a ton of fruit questions, but anytime I have somebody asking me like, oh, what I want to grow my own apples or tree fruit or whatever, I always direct them to John to your tree pest alerts because a lot of people really don't realize how important timing is when it comes to the applications for the preventative um, treatments for not only insects but also diseases and so like yeah if you are going to get edible apples at the end of the season there are things that you have to do early on you can't just this isn't like a zucchini plant in your garden that you can just put it in the ground and walk away and you come back and there's like a three foot zucchini that you don't want um, you have to <laughs> you have to put a lot of a lot more effort into uh, fruit production. So I, I do try to make sure people are going into that with their eyes wide open, that you're not going to get your perfect supermarket apple by just planting it and forgetting it. Uh, but we do have a question that came in the Q&A, John, for you about treating pine needle scale. Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's they a... say they's got a 50 foot tree oh that's uh, difficult slash impossible to spray. How do you treat it or do you just ignore it? I'm leaning towards ignore, but le let me ask you this. Obviously there's some needles low enough that you can see them and thresholds have been worked out for pine needle scale. In other words, how many pine needle scales can you have before it's a problem, before you need to spray? And what you wanna look at is some of your lower branches that you can reach. And if you find more than four per needle, and you're going to count more than one, you know, oh, and it's on the new needles, the needles that came out this year. And if you start seeing some of them forming on that, and if you can't, you're looking at last year's. But uh, if you're finding more than four on every one that you're looking at, you probably need to treat. My guess is you're not. It does tend to be an annoyance but it's not a real problem. 
Uh, and so if I, oh, I found three on this needle and one on this needle and none on these needles and six on this needles and you average them out. Uh, it's usually not a problem. Where I see it, a real problem is on mugo pines, those small pines, uh, rather than the 50 footers because we get better airflow with the taller ones. But the smaller ones, I've seen some of those that look literally like they've been flocked. Uh, they're pure white at a distance. And for those treatments might be a value, but we missed the window. It's back when lilacs uh, were really in bloom is our window for treatment there. And my treatment of choice wouldn't be what I would do this year. I would have lived with it this year because the treatment of choice is a horticultural oil. But if you read the label for the oils, you don't want to use them during hot weather. And unfortunately, that's precisely what we had. And so since scales are a problem that kind of build up over time and such, uh, they're not something that requires immediate treatment. And I will say, if you go out and spray with most of the other insecticides, you're killing a lot of things that eat scales. And really what manages scales the best is everything else that eats them. And so we want to try to either live with the scale as a minor problem, not affecting the plant, or really do the soft touch. The horticultural oils are what I usually recommend. It's an armored scale, which is a hard scale. And so it's very difficult to control with some of the other treatments, the pour around the base and that. Those work well on soft scales, but not on hard scales. So I will say this is a difficult one to manage, particularly in a large tree. Anything to add to that, Amanda? Nope, we did <laughs> that, that was all you. <laughs> all right. Well, I, 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 I know you hate killing all creatures near. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the discussion of like, yes, looking for your thresholds before just like spraying things. I, you know, definitely agree with like, do your scouting, do your thresholds. Don't just spray first and then ask questions later. Because yes, those things like aphids and scales, we have loads of predators out there and Granted, you've got to understand that the predators are not going to get those insects down to a zero population level, but they will get them down to something that's maybe not as noticeable or not really causing any issues. Yep. Good. Good. Um, you know what? We're, we got a few minutes, so you got to you got to help me out here because there was one question I had, <laughs> and that was you said that if you go on the internet. You're not going to get good information about chiggers. And that shocked me because I believe everything on the internet. But, but I'm curious, you mentioned a couple of things, but what are the big misconceptions? I mean, what do, you, what do you read about on the internet that says that this is absolutely wrong about chiggers? Oh, one of the biggest thing is that people think that the chiggers burrow into your skin and remain on your body for the entire time that you have the itchy welts. That is absolutely incorrect and so they say that that's why people like paint clear nail polish over chigger bites because they say that they're suffocating the chigger what that's actually doing is just sealing your wound away from the air and so that you know helps it maybe not hurt as much or feel as itchy but it is not in any way suffocating the chigger I, I don't know about everybody watching this right now, but why she was talking about it, I, I've been scratching. <laughs> it's kind of one of those, you know, I've been outside and uh, that, oh, and I do have a question here for all panelists. I can't find any information about seven. Do you dislike using it? No, it's an insecticide that's been around since 1970. Um, and it's one that you can commonly buy. So it's not that I would disagree with its use, but as Amanda mentioned, we want to make sure that you time it accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the problems with seven is it's very good at killing pollinators uh, yep. and that. So we want to be real cautious on using it, for example, when something's in bloom, because you're going to end up killing a lot of non-target organisms. So no, if by chance it, it, it appeared that we were saying, no, don't use seven, not at all. Uh, but seven and malathion and that are, are what I would call general insect killers. They kill a lot of things that are out there crawling. They're not targeted at a particular group of insects. Uh, so they're good to kill a lot of things, but they're bad in that they kill a lot of things. And so uh, use them with caution. That's it. Read and follow label directions. But uh, nope, uh, we use seven in our garden. So it's uh, not something that's that's bad. Oh, 
we're going to be out of town for two weeks and Japanese beetles will eat our grapevines by the time we're back. Uh, we're going to give them the address so they know right, right. where to go for the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, well, and one thing too with that is you do, if you've, so seven also, it used to be always carbaryl was the active ingredient in seven, and that's not necessarily the case anymore. So it is important to check oh, the label for the product that you have there. And it, it's always tough for me when somebody's like, well, yeah, can I, can I spray seven on, you know, Japanese beetles? And it's like, what, you know, send me the picture of the label of the product that's in your garage or in your shed so that I can look at the exact same label because depending on the formulation and also the age of the product, there's going to be important information on there that if I just Google it and look at the first label that I find might not be the same. And, and that's um, a good point. I mean, you know, and, and again, what we try to do is, is give common names here rather than mm -hmm. the active ingredients. But yeah, that's always a good follow up. But, you know, we're coming up to the end of the show here and we do have a question going out of town for two weeks. Well, and the Japanese beetles will eat our grapes by the time we get back. Um, Rhoda, it's a fruit question. <laughs> what would you do and you get a minute <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna i'd turn it back over to amanda because it's, it's japanese beetles <laughs> none of us want this one <laughs> uh, well you know what I, the the one thing that i that i go to is neem oil but neem oil has to it, you could not apply it and be gone for two weeks Right. And so when we're when we're sitting here trying to think of what to answer, the the thing that's catching us is the two week issue. Mm -hmm. You need something that's persistent, uh, whereas some of these others and neem oil will work, but it's it's applied almost on a regular basis. And uh, the, the problem with persistent ones, of course, is we're getting up to days to harvest time. Right. Yep. So any suggestions, Amanda, what we could do is we're getting closer to harvest and Obviously, they need to read and follow label directions, but what's the one we could, anyone got a thought? So if you've got somebody maybe watching your place for two weeks, you could put the pheromone trap like far away from your grapevines and have somebody check the Japanese beetle trap. And as it's getting full, either put out a new one and you know ditch the old one so you're not just like attracting Japanese beetles, but also adult Japanese beetles are the hardest life stage of that insect to kill. Yeah, Like that. that's another reason why I'm like a little iffy on the whole seven for them because like you pretty much have to like spray them directly. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and, and the uh, neem oil is the same way. I mean, you gotta yeah. keep, re I like the neem oil. It's a little lighter touch. But yeah, it's a continual thing. Now, I'm with you on the Japanese beetle traps, but as we're wrapping this up, we want I want everyone to, to take a look at her hand gesture way <laughs> far <laughs> away uh, because that is critical. When I was living in Michigan and Massachusetts, a lot of people would say, well, I got a Japanese beetle trap and I've got it right in my rose garden. Perfect. <laughs> Because the problem with Japanese beetle traps is it draws them to them uh, from a considerable distance. And Japanese beetles get forgetful as they get closer to the trap mm -hmm. and decide, oh, there's a rose. Oh, there's a grape. <laughs> um, so, Amanda, how far away? And I like that hand motion, but give me a <laughs> scale. How far away would you put it? in your neighbor's yard no no we're not going there as we're wrapping this up we will. <laughs> but realistically like as far away on your property um from those grapes and then have somebody who's who's going to check it because that's the thing with some of these traps is that they also they work not only by attracting the beetles to the trap but then also once they crawl in they either get stuck or drown in some liquid or otherwise you know yeah. trapped but if you get too many of them in there, the trap can fill up and they'll be attracted, but they won't die. So that's where you end up with a Japanese beetle trap overflow and then they're just buffet in your yard. Right. So I would say 100 feet. Would you go with 100 feet? That'd be good. Yeah. And, 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 and too small of a yard or too close. I, I wouldn't mind right. 100 feet. Not in your neighbor's yard. That was a joke. Not, <laughs> not, not real. Not extension advice. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. And, and seriously, if you could do that and have someone check on it, quite honestly, that's the best. Because Amanda's right. 
the adult is is almost impossible to kill uh, and it requires almost constant applications of just about anything. Well, so with that, uh, we'll wrap up just a little late, but again, the purpose for doing this is to make sure we answer your questions, have a little fun as well, so hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, so I'd like to thank our panelists here tonight, uh, Rhoda Burles, our extension uh, horticulturist who's out in Rapid City. Uh, uh, we've got Amanda here in uh, Pier, so we're just having the entire state and oh my gosh, we even have Aberdeen here uh, with Garrett here. And again, John Ball and uh, Brookings, but literally during the summertime, I live in a truck and uh, crisscross the state almost continuously. So we always uh, enjoy the opportunity to come and chat with you for the evening. Hopefully you got a lot of good information uh, from us tonight. Uh, please let us know in two weeks what you did on the grapevines, because uh, I think we'll all be kind of curious about this. So with that, we'll end for this evening. Thank you, everybody. Uh, hope you all have a good week and see you on the next edition of the Garden Now. Thank John, you again. Perhaps we should mention we'll be gone in two weeks. <laughs> well, I was going to say that next week, but you know, you wrecked my rhythm there. But yes, <laughs> in, in two weeks, we will not be on. And the reason for that, it's not that we're all going on vacation, uh, but we're going to have a lot of fun. And that is the Master Gardener class. It's the Master Gardener Roadshow. And so all of us will be doing a program on Tuesday in Brookings, South Dakota for all the current and the previous year's Master Gardeners. Good time to get together. And then we head off to uh, Pier on Wednesday and then Rapid City on Thursday, timed well with almost the beginning of the rally. Uh, <laughs> so we got something to do afterwards. So again, next week we're on, but we'll remind you then that the following week, uh, our road show is going on and uh, we'll not be on for that episode. So with that, and thank you, Rhoda, for that reminder. Good night, everyone.